Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. This week I have a review of a graphic novel, but one I'm doing a slightly different style on uh, than my other reviews. Back during the World Cup, I discovered a graphic novel called Porecraft, which was being serialized, one page at a time, by its author on Tumblr. I enjoyed the pages that I had gotten, but I had some questions about what was to come, and some thoughts about what was had already been included. So I did some checking around and discovered that the whole graphic novel was, in fact, already out and available from my local library. So I checked out the book and read the whole thing. Some bits I liked. So, but I didn't, and in particular, I had some complaints about information that was omitted, things that could have gone with more emphasis, and some inclusions of information that I felt was absolutely bizarre. And similarly, some omissions of information that were kind of equally bizarre. So, these are my thoughts on this, on these omissions in Porecraft. And, as I discovered the graphic novel during the World Cup, I'm going to chop this, sec this review up into three sections. Throw-ins, for information that was likely omitted due to lack of space, but could be included in perhaps a later revision, if they do revise the edition. Yellow cards, for information that was important, but wasn't included, and but wasn't really major, though. And red cards, for information that feel was vital, that was not included. Regional biases that limit the utility of the book, or information that was included, but I feel is contrary to the book's intended purpose. Without with that out of the way, let's get started. Throw-ins. There are a few little ones here, which... where I really think some of, this, some of this information should have been included, but I completely understand why it wasn't. They have space restrictions. These are the kind of things that probably fall under the category of kill your dar darlings. I'm mentioning these anyway, just for general reference of peop uh, for people, if they're reading this, if they're, they're reading the book, and want to know other people's thoughts, and also, well, you look, are kind of looking for more additional information on some things. First off, libraries. Frankly, from personal experience, when you're on a really tight budget, libraries are your lifeline. Everything you need and everything you need to know you can get from or through libraries. Can't afford to rent movies or you have to cancel your Netflix subscription because you can't afford it. Check movies out from the library, and you can check movies out from the library on DVD. In some cases, now even libraries have Blu-rays available for checkout. Need to find some new recipes to expand your diet because what you're cooking right now is getting boring. Check a cookbook out from the library, or use their their internet to check out various websites or what have you. Or even they may have DVDs of cooking shows available, like for example, goodies. Um, have to cancel your internet connection again. The beers at the library are generally kept secure, and you can use those to do some stuff that you wouldn't otherwise be able to, that you would need the internet for, but you might not be able to do, well, yeah, email, that sort of stuff. All the necessary internet requirements of life. And heck, some libraries even offer video games for checkout these days. And your local library, depending on where you live, may also have monthly screenings of recent film releases. Maybe not like the current stuff in theaters now, but, you know, second or third run things. Maybe some stuff that's just coming out on DVD, but hasn't gotten a, gotten in any of the rental services in terms of being made available. Now the book covers some of this, but it mainly focuses on the ability to check out passes to, to local museums. And it doesn't really get into just how useful libraries are when you're trying to save money. I'm glad that the book covers some of it, covers what they do, but it could have stood to go a little more. Next, the cooking section, while very expansive, could actually stand to be a little more. One of the things I've encountered when encountering people who don't know how to cook is difficulties, for example, figuring out the hardware of cooking. A good example of this, to those in the audience who watch Break Your Dead Air, is an anecdote Nash gave on the show actually about a year or two ago where he talked about accidentally starting a kitchen fire while cooking Hamburger Helper. This is, like, back at his last place. Um, and his experience, among others, kind of caused him to give up on trying to cook. When he described the incident, the description of, that he gave of how it happened 
kind of gave me the clue that the problem he was running into was the pen he was using was too small. In other words, he has the wrong hardware. Now, in the book, the guy does a really good job of covering the software of cooking, ingredients, cooking methods, that sort of thing. But it could have gone a little more in-depth when it comes to, like, picking out sizes of cookware. And I also could have really gone with a reiteration of Elton Brown's prohibition against unitaskers. If you're trying to stock your kitchen with hardware on a budget, getting rid of most of the unitaskers is a pretty good way to go. Um, garlic presses, they're a unitasker. They're nice to have, but you don't necessarily need them. You can always use the blade of a knife or something else to, to, to crush your garlic cloves. And in particular, I'm not giving advice. Um, one of the things they don't recommend, don't, well, they don't say, which I'd recommend is for saucepans, having a couple different sizes. One that holds a little more, a little over 24 ounces or if you're using the metric system, about 0.7 liters, and one that holds around 50 ounces, or about 1.5 liters or more. Also, while the book recommends getting a cast iron skillet, I'd also recommend getting a cast iron Dutch oven. Dutch ovens have the advantage of they are they do the thing that's, that sauce, saucepans and stockpots don't, which is you can start a dish in the Dutch oven, and on the stove, and then directly transfer it from the from the stove to the oven to finish cooking. It is a stove safe and oven safe safe cooking thing. And additionally, Dutch ovens also work really well if you're doing, for example, frying. Um, they do a good job of holding on and retaining heat and helping you manage the temperature of what you're cooking better. Uh, additionally, related to this. It, when they talk about getting a cooking thermometer, um, one thing that bears mentioning is getting something you can cook you can clip to the side of a pan as sort of a culinary future proofing. If you want to fry something or, or need to fry something for a recipe and you need to check the temperature of your oil, you're set. You can clip your um, probe to the pan and you can just get a very easy to read temperature. If you're trying to melt chocolate or otherwise make candy, Using a double bo using um, your saucepan on the stove again, you're also set. It helps you measure your water temperature um, or the temperature of the material inside the pan. So again, a couple little things could have been included, but didn't necessarily need to be included. Nice to have them, but I understand why they're not there. Yellow card. These are things which are important, but not very big, that really could and should have been considered and discussed in the book and weren't. Um, or these are material that, that is in the book, that is brief, and probably should have been omitted, but wasn't. And also, bring, also, I'm also bring up here a little obsolete information that comes up as well. The book gets into urban gathering, and they particularly spend a lot of time talking about mushrooms. Now, Urban Gathering is a great way to get some additional fresh fruit. In Oregon, we have lots of Himalayan blackberry bushes around on publicly accessible land because ODOT decided way back in the day that they would bring in this plant to do erosion control. The problem is it's only slightly less prolific than kudzu, and it's very difficult to kill and it has thorns that are like razor wire. But on the other hand, they have fruit. They have blackberries, and they're very delicious blackberries. So you have situations where it's not hard at all to find, like, unpesticide sprayed Himalayan blackberry bushes, lots of, with fruit on it, in season, that you can just pick whenever you want. And you can pick a lot of the, of the blackberries from them. Uh, similarly, Oregon, Kind of is, but kind of used to be a big state for growing hazelnuts or filbers. Um, it's not hard to find abandoned hazelnut orchards. In some cases where hazelnut orchards have spread out of private property into public property. This, uh, this does get in the point of, in some cases, of consulting with the landowner, where if they just have a hazelnut orchard, they're just leaving alone. 
to ask permission to pick your hazelnut, pick their hazelnuts, but still. Hazelnuts, easy to get through urban, urban gathering. We get pear trees and apple trees around here as well. Most fruit, frankly, you don't need to take a class for because most fruit is not actually toxic in terms of the things that we recognize. There aren't that many toxic pears. There aren't that many toxic, actively toxic blackberries. Mushrooms, on the other hand, they're the kind of thing where you, where, and like the book advises taking a class on how to identify the different types of mushrooms and going with a group with somebody who is an expert in mushrooms so they know which ones you can pick and which ones you can't. And mushrooms are the kind of thing where if you don't have those class, like those classes, if you don't go with that group, you could very easily end up in the hospital. So, putting the amount of attention in the book that they do on mushroom gathering seems a little odd. It's like talking about doing your own car repair and starting off with talking about how to fix your transmission. It's not the right way to go. Next, the book has a bias against car ownership, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, but this leads into a focus the book has on finding apartments and places to live that are apartments, rent, homes for rent, or what have you, that are very walk-friendly uh, or bike-friendly, which is good. It's a good, th it's a good way to do And Even if you have a car, being someplace where you can walk to lots of your important places, are that like your grocery store or what have you is a good way to help save money on gas now what the book could have gone into at least briefly is bike maintenance um good way to save money on your bike is well knowing how to do some of the repairs and and maintenance on your bike like keeping your chains greased and so um, and so forth and so on on your own rather than having to take your bike to a repair place to have them work on it um, having some information on resources for bicycle repair and maintenance, as well as a way to find local cycling groups to help you learn new cycling ways around your area, or better cycling ways, or that sort of thing, could have been really useful, wasn't really covered. Last but not least for this section is the book kind of takes the stance that you should never really do anything to get in any sort of debt. Recommending if you have to buy a car, you should basically pay for the car in full outright and, go, and only buy used and not take out credit cards. Talk about the car a bit later, but there are actually good reasons to have credit cards, which the book kind of dismisses. When making purchases online, you're really better off with a credit card or going through a service with a strong identity theft or asset retrieval department like PayPal. The idea is this, for, for doing this. When you're buying online, and when you use a credit card, you are at least temporarily paying with the credit card company's money up until when you've paid your bill. Consequently, if you are scammed by a seller online through delivery of the wrong product, or a non-functional product, or non-delivery, or any other number of points, you still have your money while you go through the, through the dispute process with your seller. And if the dispute process doesn't go through, you can call the credit card company and request a stop payment, or report fraud, or what have you, because you've been ripped off. The same thing applies if an identity thief has stolen your debit card number. Um, number. Okay. The same thing applies if an identity thief has stolen your credit card number. You aren't directly out of money. Credit card company is. Once you discover the theft, you can contact your credit card company and their identity theft division, and they have a big identity theft division, will handle pursuing the thief. You, however, aren't out of any money. With with either of these, though, whether it's through being ripped off through a fraudulent seller, or through identity theft, if an identity thief, if you if your debit card number is compromised, if you pay with debit card, then you are out of money that you need to pay bills. And while you'd still be going through some of the same dispute resolution processes for uh, for fraudulent purchases or getting ripped off through a seller, like on eBay, 
or through the identity theft investigation and um, all, the, all that process with your bank, you are still out your money. So, consequently, it's worth it to have a credit card to basically serve as an airlock to protect your assets. Just don't use it as extra money. Pay down your balance in full each month. Additionally, when you get a credit card, or if you get a credit card, try to make sure you get a credit card with no annual or monthly fee. Um, or um, or at least if you get one that's an annual fee, have, get it where it's a kind of annual fee to be paying anyway, in terms of, for example, Costco has a Costco credit card. The Costco credit card, the annual fee for that is your Costco membership, as long um, if you're paying your annual, if you're paying your annual fee, you are also a member of Costco. Simple. Um, so, having the Costco, for example, if you're going to get a credit card, having a Costco credit card isn't a bad way to go. Particularly, the only other problem I could see for well, you might not want to get one is, for example, it's an American Express card. And if you do shopping at places that don't take American Express, you're kind of out of luck. Additionally, your if you bank through a credit union, not a big bank like Chase or whatever, but a credit union, talk to them, talk to your credit union, and see if they offer a credit card which has no annual or monthly fee. If you are a member of the credit union, um, but yeah, main thing here: pay your credit, pay your credit card balance in full every month. Get it through somebody who doesn't charge an annual or monthly fee who you're already doing business with. Your credit union, your um, Costco, or what have you. Red card. So here are the big ones. Stuff that needed to be in this book and was not. Or material that serves no purpose and should have been removed in favor of stuff that would have been actually useful. First off... There's about a chapter of this book focused on urban farming, and over half of which is related to urban animal husbandry, and in particular, raising chickens. Now, I get raising your own herbs and vegetables. Parsley, cilantro, and basil in your own apartment. Um, or if you have an actual like space to do real gardening, growing vegetables like tomatoes, green, pep green peppers, or even pumpkins, is a great way to provide fresh fruits and vegetables on a reduced budget. Um, and, well, <sighs> raising chickens is freaking nuts. With the vegetables, oftentimes these seeds are cheaper than <clears throat> buying a already grown plant. Not, not just grown plant to plant in your area, but also in terms of like grown fruit or vegetable in terms of your peppers, your tomatoes, your carrots, what have you. But, but like, but, but chickens? The book explicitly states that raising chickens yourself is more expensive than the cost of purchasing eggs from the store. Um, or purchasing a chicken from the store. The back of the book, I mean, the book is called, full title, Poor Craft, The Funny Book Fundamentals of Living Well on Less. Not sustainability craft, the funny book fundamentals of living well with a lower environmental footprint. Now, the animal husbandry thing is something that would fit perfectly in the second book. If you're trying to be sustainable, if you're trying to lower your sort of carbon footprint, um, that's a good way to do it. You're raising, you're raising chickens, growing, getting your own eggs without having to, to get eggs that were driven to the store through a factory farming process and that sort of thing. The whole animal husbandry thing works great there. Here, though, it doesn't fit. The second book would sell. Sustainability Craft, not only would that, I think it would sell, hell, I'd want to read a copy of it. or And possibly even buy a copy. But the whole idea of raising chickens when you're trying to get by on less, when the chickens do not, in fact, pay for themselves ever, makes it not fit here in this book. 
Finally, we get to the matter of the general coverage of cars. This book operates on the assumption that you live in an urban area, solid mass transit network, and enough sidewalks that you can walk most places without having to walk in the road. It operates on the assumption that if you don't live someplace that, where you have that, you can move to someplace that does and either retain your current job with a new one that will cover the cost of the move. And I don't mean that just in terms of, oh, it'll pay for the cost of the move in terms of the money that you'll make at your new job, but in terms of your employer will contribute to the cost of moving. You can ask for a, or if they cover relocation costs, and they'll say yes. This leads to my problems. First, not all jobs will cover the cost of your move. Further, in a down economy, like what we have now, an employer is going to more likely choose new hires who don't have to pay relocation costs for over ones who need to move, and in some cases, long distances. If just on the general basis of cost of, of a new hire, cost of training, or cost of training plus relocation costs, we'll pick the lower one. Um, basing your book on the assumption that your reader can move to someplace where all the other advice becomes valid is kind of unreasonable. And ultimately, is there many, many valid reasons to own a car, whether for your job or because whether we're the place you live means you need to get around or get groceries with a car because the grocery stores are too far away or what have you. If you ignore these reasons, you're undermining your own book and undermining your own arguments in lots of other areas as well. And this leads me to your next problem. The book literally tells you to get rid of your car. You're better off without it. And if you must have a car, the only advice they give at all in the book is on buying a car with no advice on how to, well, get by with it afterwards and handle maintenance and that sort of thing on a reduced budget afterwards. Cars can be a money sink if you don't know how to take care of them yourself. <clears throat> there are ways to help you keep, running, keep the car running for you less, whether changing your own oil and filters or, doing your own, or learning how to do your own auto repair, and there's enough information here to merit its own chapter in the book, or at least do replace the necessary material in animal husbandry, but the book doesn't have that information. Uh, it's just, oh, buying a car, that's it. And that's really disappointing. That's really useful information that would make this book better, but it's not there. <clears throat> so in conclusion, is this a good book? Is Poor Craft a good book? Eh, it's okay. The chapters on shopping, cooking, home and apartment repair and cleaning are fantastic. The information there on how to make your own home cleaning products is great. And the portion on finding an apartment is incredibly useful. But the book has some serious flaws in other areas that really keeps it from being a much buy. Um, I've heard people describe this as the book that is a better replacement for all oh, the places you'll go for as someone who's graduating from uh, college. And to a certain degree, that's true, in the sense that, oh, the places you go doesn't tell you how to make your own Windex. But it doesn't, but it, the book has serious flaws that prevent it from achieving its full potential. I really think this book could stand to get a revised and expanded edition, um, with, in particular, the sections expanded that I've discussed previously, and if not some material removed, then at least some new material added to uncover important information to cover important information on how to live well on less. And I really hope we get that revision at some point in the future. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to find out when the next video comes out. Also, if you'd like to see me put videos out a little more often, or to increase my production quality, or if you want to request a particular topic, please chip into my Patreon. There's a link in the upper right, and I'll have a link in the show notes as well. If you um, click on that and chip in, hopefully all this will become a little better. Thank you very much again, and I'll see you next time.